Good evening all and welcome to our latest creepy pasta collections with four great stories to share. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I was 16 when I first saw the crack, a jagged line, about four feet long but less than an inch wide. I found it by the sidewalk behind my house, not on the sidewalk. The crack was in the air, visible from every direction as I circled around it, harmlessly suspended and nothing more. I couldn't touch it. My hands passed through as though it wasn't there. Although my hand was white and numb with cold by the time it reached the other side. I wouldn't even walk close to it. Something about the emptiness just rubbed me the wrong way. I've walked around caves, stared down holes, even used a telescope to look at the space between the stars. This wasn't like that. It felt less like something was missing and more like something extra that shouldn't be there. My family moved shortly after that, and I guess I forgot all about it for a while. Time moved steadily forward, except maybe for a few months after college when it stopped to let me admire my future wife. She had the kind of smile that hinted at a secret, and if I had to guess, I'd say it was the secret to being happy. I would have given anything to explore every hidden crevice of her mind, knowing her as she knew herself, until one day we could start making new secrets of our own. It was about a week after we met at work, when we both had stayed late to clean up after an office party. I asked her to come sit on the roof and look at the sky with me. There we were, side by side the space between our hands burning like fire, the shape of her mouth illuminated with the backdrop of endless stars, gleaming like millions of envious eyes wishing they could sit where I was sitting now. I didn't know anything could make me feel so weak. My legs were trembling, and I remember having to keep switching positions so she wouldn't notice. I didn't trust the words in my mouth or the thoughts in my brain or any other part of me which was blurred out of existence to make room for my appreciation of everything that she was. That's when I saw the crack again, and I was reminded how powerful weakness could be. It was larger now, running along the side of an external AC unit. Not quite alongside. If I really looked, I could see the empty air between the metal box and the crack. I could just make out the little streaks of light where the surrounding stars bled their light into the hole to be lost forever. A cookie cutter gap in reality that the world had forgotten to fill in. You can leave whenever you want, she'd said. I guess she noticed that I was distracted. I shook my head, prompting her fingers to trace their way up my hand. I turned to her, and her breath warmed against my mouth. And suddenly, that was the only thing in the world. Six months and we were engaged. Another year and we were married. Neither of us stayed long at that office, and I never went back up to that roof. The crack didn't matter. Bad dreams can't hurt you once you've woken up. And beside her grace, I was awake for the very first time. Things went well for us, but we were so in love that I don't think we would have noticed if they hadn't. I got an investment banking job and climbed the corporate ladder. I started seeing more cracks, but no one else seemed to notice, so I didn't mention them either. Sometimes they had aligned perfectly to an existing object, but I could feel their emptiness pooling at me, and I knew what they really were. There was one big one above the conference room table at work, but I had a future here and would let something like that get in the way of my success. My diligence paid off when my boss finally told me 
that he was getting older and wanted me as partner for the firm. He was standing right on the other side of the crack when he said it, so it was difficult to maintain eye contact with him. Unless that isn't something you want, he'd said, misreading my silence. Of course you can leave whenever you want. The same words, but I hadn't recognized the significance yet. I just smiled and shook his hand, careful to reach underneath the crack hanging between us. It was another dream come true, and I was king of the world. My wife and I moved into a big house, and we had a baby girl together. I watched her grow and watched the cracks grow with her. Hairline fractures splintered the sky and mapped their web throughout the air. I had to be careful where I was walking. There would be a dozen of them in my path within any given day. I passed through a big one once in my car. I was changing lanes and didn't notice it at the time. The crack went straight through my windshield without disturbing the glass, passing through my heart and out the other side. Cold doesn't begin to describe it. The line erased my body as it passed through me, displacing skin and organs, leaving a suckling vacuous wound for the briefest instant before it was gone. I lurched at the wheel and spun off the road into the guardrail. My hands kept racing over my chest, fists pounding against the solid skin to reassure myself that I was whole. I started working from home after that. There's a bathroom that doesn't have any cracks in it, and I spend most of my time in there. I've seen my wife and daughter walk straight through them without the slightest notice. I can't explain to them what I see, and I feel because I know they'll think I'm crazy. And maybe I am, but that doesn't change anything. I'll sit in here for hours at a time, working on my laptop or reading a book, loath to leave where I might stumble through what isn't there. My wife begged me to leave, and sometimes I'd open the door just to walk around the house or sit with her in the living room. But I couldn't go outside anymore. There were too many of them. More every day, it seemed like. The world around me had shattered, and I was the only one to notice. I know it hurt her. But in time, my wife accepted that this is how life was going to be. She made the best of it, always inviting friends or family here and making excuses when I was expected somewhere. She took cooking classes and learned how to make all my favorite meals, even getting a small table and television installed in the bathroom I was confined in. My daughter was a different story. Eight years old now, and no amount of explaining could make her understand how much I loved her, even if I wasn't always there. I didn't know how embarrassed she was of me until a teacher called to let me know she'd been telling all her friends that I was dead. I made an effort to sit with her in the kitchen to ask why she'd done all that, but all she said is that I might as well be. And she was right. I wasn't taking care of my family anymore. They had enough money put away that they didn't need me to work. I was just a burden, and just like the cracks, I was growing bigger every day. Some nights I wouldn't leave the bathroom to go to bed, and I could hear my wife crying through the wall between us. I tried pushing myself harder, willing myself through the emptiness. It wasn't any good. They cut through me like a knife, froze me to my core, shredding bone and sinew and stitching me back together so seamlessly that there was nothing but the memory of that pain to remind me of my torrent. I was ready for this to be over. I just didn't know until I heard the words of my daughter's mouth as she pressed against the other side of the bathroom door. You can leave whenever you want. Yes, I told her. I'm ready. All you've got to do is throw yourself into a big one, she said. You'll be out. She knew about them? 
I jumped up and flung open the door. She wasn't there. I raced down the hall, shouting her name, forcing myself through each searing darkness that severed my mind and body, heart and soul. There she was, standing outside next to the biggest abyss I had ever seen. A wall of darkness, ten feet across and ripping through the air above like a skyscraper. I could feel the call of that emptiness, whispering to me, beckoning me. A promise of freedom and release that a lifetime of memories could not dissuade. Just do it already. You've been here long enough, she said. But I was afraid. Even this far away from the blackness, I could remember how those dark talons would feel as they rend my body. Would there be anything left to me that came out the other side? It was big enough that I didn't have to come out at all. I could step in and be gone. It's what my daughter wanted. So did my wife. If only she had the courage to admit it. And maybe it's what I wanted too. But on my knees, before all of creation and its antithesis, I was afraid. It's easy. Just follow me. I tried to stop her. Air dragging through my lungs, feet stumbling and twisting beneath me, lunging, desperate grab. I tried to stop her from entering that blackness. But she was gone. And there was no choice but to follow. Into the looming void I plunged. Screaming without sound. Bleeding without wounds. Disintegrating into nothing. And then I opened my eyes. I was reclining in a padded chair, like they have at the dentist's office. Three men were standing over me, a plethora of beeping machines, IV lines, and heart rate monitors cluttered the room to either side. Well? One of them asked. How was it? You were out for almost an hour. I couldn't answer. There was nothing left of me to answer. We kept sending signals telling you it was okay to leave, another man said. Didn't you get them? I closed my eyes and took a long breath. Life 2.0 still had some bugs, but they told me they'd figure out how to fix most of the cracks if I wanted to go again. It's going to be ready for the market soon, they said. People are going to love it, they said. Did you notice anything else that needs fixing? They asked me. Just in this world, I replied. The red lights are only making the pain worse. It's an immense, earth-shattering pain in my midsection and in my head. I try to move, but I can't. I try to speak, but I can't do that either. It hurts too much and my voice obeys me no more than do my joints, or my muscles, or my bones, or my mind. And yet still there is movement. I can feel myself being lifted up and placed on something. A bed, maybe? Or... No. A gurney. Alright, one of the EMTs says, and several others then roll me into the back of an ambulance and climb in behind me but I'm already fading fast and feeling an inexplicable heat by the time those doors are shut. One EMT, a blonde woman, looks at me with a furrowed brow just as I'm slipping away and says aloud, Wait, wait, I think I know... We're made of that stuff, right? I turned around. There was a woman there, red-haired and about my age, give or take, and she was alarmingly beautiful, but... How long she'd been staring at the exhibit alongside me, I had no idea. I'm sorry? I said, you know we're made of that stuff, right? She nodded at the museum wall, which depicted in detail the births and life cycle and deaths of stars. I pursed my lips. We're made of stars? Yep, isn't it awesome? She stepped up beside me and moved her arm across the diagram as she spoke. 
I just watched a documentary about it last night. Stars are just fusion factories held together by their own gravity. They start off fusing hydrogen to helium, and then they keep going on and on, fusing heavier and heavier elements, until they're fusing the heaviest stuff. Then, they exhaust their fuel and collapse under their own weight, and they blow off their outer layers, and pretty much shower the galaxy with all these random elements, some of which are eventually used to create life. Huh. Yeah, I'm Robin, by the way. She extended her hand and I shook it. Uh, hey, Brian, nice to meet you. There was an awkward pause before I said, All right, I got one for you. If you replaced the sun with a black hole, what would happen? Depends on its mass. Nope. The answer is, drum roll please, nothing. I mean, everything would get dark and cold, but we wouldn't fall in. Earth's orbit would remain entirely unaffected. If the black hole had the same mass as the sun. What? What you said would only be true if the black hole in question happened to have the same mass as the sun. Which it wouldn't, because the sun isn't massive enough to collapse into a black hole. Oh. Damn. Yep. Me one, you zero. Sorry, pal. All right, I said. You're on. Whoever gets the most points by closing time buys drinks. She smiled at that and punched me in the shoulder, just light enough not to stain. All right, loser. Come, Come on. on, the EMT says. There's a flurry of activity around me, and there are voices too, and blinding lights, and a cooling down of that monstrous heat. One of the paramedics is looking me over. Then he looks at another colleague. The blonde woman. And he shakes his head. Slowly. This one's gone, Rachel. But she continues running tests. Running diagnostics. Placing a soft hand on my arm in case I'm awake enough to appreciate the comfort. I am. Barely. But I'm fading fast. And that heat is coming right on back as I do. Not yet he's not. She says. There's pain in her voice that she does her fruitless best to conceal. I already lost another one earlier, Todd. I'm not losing- Another one, Robin said, and I laughed and agreed, and we rushed to the back of the line. See, told you you'd like the Ferris wheel. Can't believe you've never been on one before today. She shrugged. Never thought they were as extreme as roller coasters, so I wasn't interested. Well, they're not supposed to be extreme. Ferris wheels are for all the parents waiting on their kids and sick people trying to relax their stomachs so they don't puke funnel cake all over the pavement. And adorable young couples, apparently. And just then, we were waved into the next seat. We sat ourselves down, and moments later, the great wheel began to groan and protest, and finally, to turn. It dragged our cart around its underside, and then lifted it up, 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 to the top of its crest, where we could see the whole city at twilight, and the ships in the harbour that were backlit red with the setting sun, and the clouds that were lined at their tops with just a little bit of starlight. Robin snuggled up next to me and put her head on my shoulder, and I put my arm around her waist. For a moment then, I could have sworn the empty seat in front of us moved on its own and furrowed my brow. But then Robin spoke. Thank you for being here with me, she said. I didn't respond with words. I just kissed her on her head and held her tight as the wheel began taking us down. Down on the 1800 block of Gardensdale, one of the EMTs says. Yeah, yeah, another one, I know. Hell of a fucking night, isn't it? The conversation is muffled again in short order. I'm drifting in and out. But the jostling of the room and the sound of the engine tell me that we're still in the ambulance. The other paramedics, for their part, continue running tests and checking my vitals. And as they work, I try to remember what's happened. But it hurts. Damn it, does it hurt. Almost as much as the rushing heat. And the effort is further disrupted when the ambulance hits a bump in the road and I nearly spill out of the gurney. 
but Rachel puts her steady hand on my chest and says, Hang in there, Brian. We're almost... There! Robin pointed at the interstate ramp, and I took the turn and put St. Thomas Vineyard away in the rear view. Still can't believe Mason got married, I said. He's only known that girl for, what, a year? Less? Robin shrugged. They were in love. They hardly knew each other. They don't know if whatever they're feeling is genuine, lifelong love, or just new relationship googly eyes that hasn't worn off yet. I guarantee it. And I'll put money on this. They'll be done within a year. Just watch. You don't know that, she said. There was a brief pause, and then she added, We've been dating for two years. So? So how far off do you think we are? I shrugged. I don't know. Haven't really thought about it. You haven't thought about it at all? I mean, of course I've thought about it. I just, I don't know if we're ready, you know? I looked over at her, but she just stared out there at the rain with her chin in her palm. So I continued. Think about it like this. People prepare their whole lives for jobs, right? They start going to school as soon as they can talk, and they're not done until they're in their 20s. And it's all so they can get a piece of paper that says, Hey, hire my ass. I'm smart enough to work. But marriage? Nobody trains for that shit. People just hook up and say, Hey, we're 25 or 28. You're cute. I'm cute. Let's spend $15,000 on a giant ceremony, then live as glorified roommates for five years until we're both fat and hate each other and get divorced because neither of us knew or cared how much work this thing would require. There was a longer pause then before she said with a degree of seriousness I wasn't in the least bit prepared for. Is that where you think we're headed? Glorified roommates? Quickly, I calculated an avenue of retreat, but I calculated wrong. No, not you, I said. Not us. I mean, most people, you know? Most people just dive in and either get divorced or stick it out until someone gets heart disease. The divorce rate is more than 50% now in the US, but the I don't love you anymore rate? Shit, that's probably close to 90 by the time everyone hits middle age. I just want to make sure you're the right person, you know? If there were ever words I wish I could have taken back, it were those 12. She said nothing, but I saw her reflection in the window, and the little tear that welled up in the corner of her eye said more than words ever could. Listen, I... that came out wrong. I just meant, can you drop me off at my car, please? I thought you wanted to come over. I don't feel good. Please? And we drove in silence for a while, as the rain picked up its pace and fell in sheets and in torrents. After another twenty minutes, I made the turn onto my street and parked. And once I did, she got out without so much as a glance and walked across the road to her own car. I ran to follow. Robin, wait! I grabbed her lightly by the arm. It was slick with rainwater. Talk to me, please. What do you want? I blinked. I want you to talk to me. I just... No. I mean, with us. Where do you want this to go? Where do I want this to go? I want to be with you. Listen, I didn't mean to imply that... Uh, that I don't want that. I just want us to be smart about it, you know? Well, maybe love isn't something you can calculate on a fucking spreadsheet, Brian. She was shouting over the cacophony of the storm. Maybe it's just this thing you feel, you know? And maybe it doesn't make any damn logical sense. Maybe it's not supposed to. But that's part of what makes it special. It's an adventure. It's a jump off a cliff with me type of thing. And yeah, sure, not everyone survives the fall, I guess. But if you find the right person, then a jump off the cliff with me type adventure? Come on, Robin. We're not writing up a damn dating website profile here. This is real life. There are kids involved, and finances, and house buying, and mortgages, and all that shit. Not every day is some cute little romance comedy. This is half your life we're talking about. Two thirds even, okay? All I meant was that you have to be prepared for it. I just, I thought we were prepared. What do you mean? She dug through her purse for a moment and then held up a ring that was brilliant, even covered in rain. I felt my heart skip at least a full beat. Is that... Um, it was my mom's, 
she said. She gave it to me before she died. She said, find your partner in crime, Robin. Find someone who'll sweep you off your feet and jump off a cliff with you. There was a pause before she added. And at the time she said it, I thought I knew exactly who that person was. I tried for a moment, but I knew, beyond the shadow of a doubt, there was no combination of words in the English language that could be strung together to write this ship. Goodbye, Brian. She kissed me on the cheek and rubbed the back of her hand down it. And then she turned and got in her Civic and drove off until I couldn't see her taillights at all through the pouring of the rain. Rain's coming down hard, boys. Another of the MTs says. Careful when you unload him. There were grunts of acknowledgement, and then the back of the ambulance flew open, and the sound of storm utterly exploded into it. I felt the rush of wind and the rain pelting my skin in sheets, and together they helped a bit with the oncoming heat that still I couldn't place. And then I felt movement. The gurney dipped and hit the pavement while the paramedics held me tight to its form. And then there were shouts, and light, and running feet, and then the hospital door... Open! I shouted. The man behind the counter looked at me with a furrowed brow. I shouted it again over the sound of rainfall through the glass. I said, are you open? And then he pointed at the sign saying the opposite and went back to reading. But I wasn't taking no for an answer. I dug up my wallet and pulled a 20 from the fold and slapped it flat against the glass. Within seconds, the paper was soaked with rainwater. But it got his attention, and once he saw me there, he took pity on my plight, and the door clicked in a word and slid open. Make it quick, man. I know, I know, I will. Thank you so much. I ran down the aisles and then, true to my word, made it back to the counter in less than a minute. The man put down his book and processed the sale. Date night, he said, bagging the card after the flowers. I smiled a bit. <laughs> Something like that. And then I thanked him and ran back out to my car and got inside and took out the card and scribbled on its inner sleeve the words, Jump off a cliff with, with me. With me, with me. A doctor running alongside the cart motioned to some nurses in the hall and they ran to follow. He turns to the EMTs. Is he stable? He's slipping. All rights falling, beating slowly. Not good. Mumbled something about being too hot earlier. But if anything, his temperature's too low. Someone shows the doctor a chart. He reads it as he runs, and his face is grim. Shit. All right. Let's, let's move! I shouted at the car I'm passing. Just a little rain, assholes! But it wasn't. It was a lot of rain. Sheets and buckets and torrents of it, in fact. It long since turned into dirt and mud, and it swept up against my windshield like an ocean surf. And the road was slick with little rivers of it that ran down past the pebbles. I was going far, far too fast for such conditions, but I didn't care, care about that, the doctor said. I just want to get his fluids up, Rachel. The woman from the ambulance runs up and discusses my condition in harsh whispers with the doctor. As I fade, and as the damn heat floods back on in, it becomes impossible to hear what they're saying. But it's abundantly clear from the body language that she hasn't given up. Hope for a reunion with these guys? Well, Bolin and Snake say they're against it entirely, so that doesn't bode well for fans. But look what happened with... I switched the radio off and then wrapped both hands around the wheel with such force the knuckles turned white on the grip. The car hit 70 miles per hour, 75, 79. The windshield wipers were flying, but they weren't going fast enough. Fuck! I slammed my foot on the brakes as the lights of activity in the road came in out of nowhere from the rain. The car jolted and shuddered and fought for traction with the pavement, and I felt the tires squeal and the metals of the car grind in protest. protest. I don't care if he wants to protest, the doctor snaps back. You tell him to wait in the damn lobby like everyone else. The nurse accepts her orders and heads back out into the hallway. I'm sorry, sir. You can't see him until- Until what? That's my son in there! That's my son! That's- And then there's a scuffle of feet and more shouts as security guards drag my father from the wing. 
Rachel pauses as she hears the shouts, and then her eyes swell up a bit with tears, and she looks at my face and appears to realize something. But she doesn't say what. The shouts continue, but they fade. And so do I. And in comes the heat, as I do. That's my son! That's my boy! Let me see my boy! Stop! Please, stop. stop! The police officer had both hands up as my car barreled towards him. Stop! Stop the car! Finally, there was a jolt and a shudder as the tires gained control at last. The car slammed to a halt. Both the officer and I sighed in relief, and then he approached my window and tapped the glass with his knuckle. I lowered it. I shouted over the rain. I'm sorry, sir. Roads are crazy out here. You okay? He ignored the question. I'm going to need you to sit here for a bit, okay? He said, just until the accident's cleared up. Accident? It's bad. He nodded in the direction of the wreckage, and then he said again, just sit tight. We'll wave you over when there's an open lane. And then he ran off into the storm. I scanned the scene. There was a man on the side of the road I saw, sitting on the pavement, with a poncho for the rainfall and his head in his hands. His SUV was totaled. The front end was bent and twisted and hideously mangled. But the other car was in far, far worse shape than that. I squinted hard and could only make out panels of white amidst charred black chunks of metal and the force of the rain. But it was enough. It was a Civic. Oh, God. Oh, God. No, 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 no. I got out of the car and left the door hanging open in the rain, and then I ran forward, at least until the officer caught sight of me and ran back over and grabbed me by the shoulders. Hey, he said, I told you to wait in the car. What are you... Robin! I shouted over him. Robin! And then I saw it. A fleeting glimpse of movement. A white sheep flipped on a gurney. A strand of red hair fell from the right side and hung there as the EMTs carted away the body. Robin! I screamed. That's my girl! That's my girl! The officer was confused and stunned and did the only thing he could think to do. Drag me back to my car. No! Stop! I was inconsolable but in no shape at all to resist. Stop! Please! That's my girl! Let me see my girl! Please! Stop! One of the EMTs, covered in blood from the waist up, turned to look at the spectacle. But then someone shouted her name. Rachel! The doctor says. You with us or what? Let's go! She blinks as she stares at me, and then says, Um, yeah, sorry. I just realized this guy was... Just get the charcoal, please. We don't have time. And she does. She runs off to fetch exactly that. And then... I feel a hideously invasive sensation. A tube is being placed up my nose, and then I feel it falling down into my throat. I'm too weak to gag, but I somehow manage to clench my fist. A nurse sees the movement and holds me down to steady me. Whoa, 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 you okay, man? My roommate stumbled back as I threw open the door. I charged past him. You're coming in hot, he said again. You good, bro? But I ignored him. I went to the bathroom and I leaned up against the sink for a long moment, and I grabbed my temples and set my jaw and sobbed without a sound. Aching, racking, heavy sobs. I heard a knock. Hey, man, he said. You good, dude? Anything I can, like, get for you, or... I'm fine, I managed. It wasn't convincing in the slightest, but I didn't care. I opened up my phone. There was a text from Robin there, from this morning. It read, I love you. And they were all at once the most beautiful and the most painful words I'd ever read. I love you. I love you too. I'm coming. Hang on, baby, I'm coming. Then I backed out, and I found my dad in the contacts list, and typed, I love you, dad. Moments later, I got a response. I love you too, son. You okay? 
but I ignored it. And then I threw it open the cupboard, and I grabbed an old bottle, bottle of, of pills. pills. Hunter said. Swallowed the whole damn thing. Lucky his roommate called in when he did. But the doctor is incredulous. Well, that remains to be seen now, doesn't it? Then he turns to the door. Rachel, I got it, I got it, I'm here. All right. Fingers crossed, people. Let's see if we can't save a psycho. There are isolated chuckles. Rachel, though, almost snaps at her superior for the insult. But then someone says, Here we go. And then there is thick, wretched black stuff funneling down that tube and down into my throat. I'm almost desperate enough, but not quite strong enough to resist. I can feel it sliding and hitting the bottom, and pumping and pulsing. My heart rate is erratic. My breathing is erratic. My ability to comprehend the situation is every bit as erratic. I struggle as much as I can against the restraint, but all my effort and all my strength of arms muster up not more than a faintest whimper. But Rachel hears it. She moves to my side. She holds my head and says, in a soft enough whisper that only I can hear the words, Don't follow her, Brian. Don't follow her. Please, Jesus. I need him here. I need this win. But I begin to fade all the same. One by one, as the spikes on the EKG slow to sporadic pulses, I see the nurses turn to each other and shake their heads. One by one by one, that is. There is only a trembling Rachel there, and she's holding on for me tight enough for everyone in the room. Colin, the doctor says, just as the darkness swirls in and I feel like I'm starting to fall away. The conversation carries on as I pass. 2.32am, one nurse says, but I can hear Rachel screaming in protest. No! He's not gone! There's still time. There's still time to save him. There's still... But she's wrong. I'm already gone. Her voice and her face. Those things are behind me as I pass. They are fading away into the darkness that consumes me, and swallowing me whole and throwing me to the wind. And just when the magnitude of the situation dawns on me, then comes the heat. There are monstrous amounts of it. It rips and tears and scorches and scalds. And had I the ability to scream out or even breathe, I would have done so until my throat was hoarse. But then there was a new pain. A different pain. A hand reaches out of the blackness, and it grabs my left side forearm with such mighty force the resulting pain eclipses that of the heat, and the nails of that hand rip through the flesh. And then I'm being pulled, and there is a rushing wind. It's cool, and refreshing, and beautiful, and suddenly I'm somewhere else entirely. I blinked. The darkness was gone, and the heat with it, and that sensation of being devoured. Instead, those things had been replaced with starlit clouds as far off in every direction as the eye could see. But my arm stung like hell all the same. I looked at it. There were nail marks, I saw. Four deep cuts beneath the inner wrist and a fifth on the side, in the shape of a hand. They bled a bit. And then I heard an all-too-familiar voice. Are you okay? I stood up slowly, and I turned, holding my damaged singing arm while I did it, and said, Robin? Robin, what was that? That darkness and the heat and the... It's where you would have spent your eternity, Brian, had I not pulled you out. I had no words other than the weakest... Thanks. You know, she said, holding her own arm, suicide's not exactly what I meant by jumping off a cliff. I blinked again and took a long, deep breath. Yeah, I guess I 
didn't think things through. Not sure you fully realize how much of an understatement that is. Well, maybe I don't, but you know what? I'd do it again, Robin. I'm serious. She nearly rolled her eyes, but I doubled down on that sentiment. What I said, out there, on my street, I'm sorry. I mean it, I'm sorry, you were right. Love isn't about taxes or headaches or just tolerating each other until we're 70. It's like your mom said, it's about sweeping your girl off her feet. It's about jumping over cliffs with someone and not knowing where you'll land and not caring as long as you get there together. And if this is where we land, wherever this is, I'm okay with that. And I leaned in for a kiss. But she stopped me with a hand before it landed and I opened my eyes. I can tell you've been working on that speech for a while, she said. Over and over in my head in the car until... until I got to the scene of the wreck. I looked at the ground and then back up at her. And I realised right then that if you fucking left the earth itself, then I would too. So here I... I was wrong too, she cut me off. Well, what do you mean? About love. I was wrong. My mother was wrong. It's not just about crap you see in rom-coms and greeting cards, Brian. Again, I blinked. I know that. I know. It's, it's something you feel in your heart that defies logic and reason, not something you can put on the spreadsheet, like you said earlier. She sighed a bit and then said, Can I show you something? Uh, I guess so, sure. And then she took my hand. An infinity rolled in and faded back out, and all of a sudden, we were somewhere else entirely. Are we on the Ferris wheel? Yep. Turn around. I did. And there we were. Past Robin and past me, on the seat above and behind us. I remembered it like yesterday. We were staring out at the whole city at twilight. The ships in the harbour that were backlit red with the setting sun and the clouds that were lined at their tops with just a little bit of starlight. I rustled in my seat and it moved and past me saw it and it looked like he was about to speak. But before he did, past Robin said, thank you for being here with me and got a kiss on the head. What do you see? Robin said. Us, a year ago and change. I remember that day like it was yesterday. Your mom had just died, so I took you here to get your mind off things. You did. That was the first day in months I'd felt truly safe and truly at peace. That was love. I know it was, and I still love you. It's just a, it's a kind of love, she said, cutting me off again. And it's absolutely beautiful when it lasts, but... Can I show you something else? Um, okay, yeah. She took my hand again, and again, infinity itself rolled in and out like the tide, and we were somewhere else. The hospital, it looked like. St. Joseph's. What do you see here? I looked around. Nurses running up and down the hallway, doctors reviewing notes and talking to their patients. I don't know, a hospital. She nodded in the direction of a particular room. Look in there. So I did. There was a woman on the cot. She was emaciated and hairless and deathly frail, and the doctors inside were shutting off the last of the machines. A dying woman, I said. Looks like cancer. Yep. And what about there? I looked down. There was a nurse crouched down in front of the same door and talking to a girl. Eight or nine years old, if I had to guess, in silly voices. The girl had been crying, but the nurse managed to make her smile a bit, even as her mother died on the other side of the door. Looks like a nurse comforting a little girl. That's right, Robin said. And that little girl will remember that nurse for the rest of her life, even if they never meet again or so much as exchange names, as the lady who came to her in her darkest hour and made a smile. She turned to me. That's love too. Just as beautiful and just as precious as what we had. What's your point? She didn't answer. She just stuck out her hand with a sad smile and I took it. Infinity faded in and out back a third time. And we were in the waiting room. 
See that? Robin pointed to the corner of the room. I squinted. Oh, hey, what's Dylan doing here? He called the ambulance when you didn't come out of the bathroom, she said. He knew something was wrong, and when they drove you off, he followed them here. Been standing here ever since, asking for information on you every time a nurse walks by. He's starting to annoy them. I watched my roommate for a bit, and sure enough, he grabbed a nurse and asked her a question that I couldn't hear. She said something pleasantly dismissive, and he nodded, and then he leaned his head back up against the wall and closed his eyes. Wow, I, uh, I had no idea he cared that much. That's love too, Brian. Would you do the same for him? But she held out her hand again before I could answer, and I took it. For a fourth time, Infinity blinked. And then I was in the emergency room, looking down on myself. I was covered in vomit from the charcoal and pills, but I was still, too. Deathly still. Most of the nurses and the doctor were still walking out the door. But Rachel wasn't. She was crying openly now, making no effort to hide it. She reached for something. A needle, it looked like, or a syringe. What's she doing? You'll see soon enough. Robin said. But that there? That's also love. She held out her hand once again and said, One more. And I took it. And then we were in the parking lot of the same place. The rain was coming down harder than ever. Turn around, Robin said, and I did. And then I stopped. There were no words. It was my father in his car. He was holding a Bible up to his chest with both hands, and he was crying in a way no child should ever have to see their father cry. And that there, Robin said, that's the kind of love that can move mountains. I put my hand up against his window, but he didn't seem to notice. He can't see you, Brian, not from here. I wiped my eyes with the back of my hand. Okay, I said, I get it, I fucked up. And then she released my hand, and all of a sudden, we were back in the clouds again, under the stars. I wiped another tear before it fell. So, now what? It's too late for me to go back down there. I'm already gone. Robin took another step forward and said, Maybe not. She put her hand on my temple, and my eyes rolled back. And then I saw it. Rachel and I are on a beach. A child is playing out in the surf, and the sun hits her head just right, and for a moment, it is made of gold. And then the image fades, and another one takes its place. A birthday party. I have silver hair at my temples. Rachel does too, but it doesn't matter. Our little girl is turning ten. And then, that image fades too, and is replaced by another, and another, and another, each one yielding another moment where someone loved someone else enough for it to break through the clouds and be seen forever, even if the moment itself lasted only for a heartbeat. Finally, there is an image of Rachel and myself on a porch, as old as we are, and she holds my hand and says, I'm glad you didn't follow her. And I say back, me too and I kiss her on the head. And then Robin pulls her hand back, and there we were again, standing out there in the clouds together. How did you do that? I asked. She shrugged. Time has nearly no meaning in this place. I've been here for a while, Brian, and yet the doctors haven't even left your operating room. Don't think too much about it. Just think about what you want. That, I said. Was, was that my future? She shrugged again. Could be. I don't know what you saw, and I don't need to know. Was it enough? I nodded, and she stepped forward again and said, Then, go and get it. I'll miss you too damn much. Well, there's nothing wrong with missing someone, she said. That just means love lasted a little longer than what ignited it. So go ahead and miss me. You owe me that much. Feel the loss. Stand up to the storm like a man and memorize the pain and learn it inside out and let it roll over you in waves and run its course. And then one day you'll wake up and realize you have scar tissue where the skin used to be and you'll be stronger than the grief ever was. 
I can tell you've been working on that speech for a while. <laughs> like I said, I've been here for a while. And she kissed me one last time and said, You're made up of stars, kid. Now, go light up the world. And she was gone. Gone, Rachel, okay? He's gone. Give up, for Christ's sakes. And but I shot up right before the doctor could finish the thought. And I gasped for air. And when I did, I grabbed my chest with more strength than I had in hours. There was a needle in it. A bolt of life to the heart. Rachel broke down in tears when she saw me. Well, I'll be damned. Welcome back to the land of the living, son. And Rachel? She turned around. Good work, kid. Made me proud. And he laughed. Rachel turned back to me and tried to hide a smile while she did it. Hey there, um, how are you feeling? Better than dead. There was a pause before I added, Hey, I'm glad you got your win. She took my hand and squeezed it. For a moment she paused when she saw a scar below the wrist that looked like the result of fingernails dragging through flesh. But then she dismissed it and said, I am too. And you'll get yours, okay? I promise you will. I said, I know. And with that she got up to leave the room to go save someone else's life. Well, I took out my phone opened up the most recent text, and hit reply. Am now. Clouds of dirt trailed behind the 2001 Toyota Tacoma. Anxious, excited air filled the cab of the beat-up truck. After the year that my wife and I have had, we'd been anticipating getting a fresh start. Like a game of Tetris, I had managed to pack all of our belongings into the bed of our truck. Of course, we were severely lacking furniture, due to living in a cramped Chicago apartment prior to now. I majored in creative writing at DePaul University. I was longing to get out of the city and live in a rural town, like the one I had grown up in. I was hoping that the change of scenery would inspire me as it does most driving riders. My wife Hannah is a customer service representative, and she conducts her business over the phone and through the internet. We both wanted a change of pace, and we decided that moving would be an interesting idea. It took months of searching, but alas, we had found the perfect place. My wife and I loaded up the truck and hopped onto Lake Street. We headed west, leaving early enough to escape the morning traffic. Most people who don't live in Chicago or even Illinois don't understand that we have vast farmlands and wildlife mere miles from the hustle and bustle of the city. Our new home was a one-story ranch near the Edwards River in Mercer County, Illinois. Main roads could only take us so far. We soon found ourselves on unpaved, untreated, raw dirt roads. Trees and wildlife littered the path as we trekked to find our new home. Hannah was napping in the passenger seat when she had been woken up by the blunt end of the paved road. She looked confused when she awoke, clearly unfamiliar with her surroundings. She soon sunk back into her seat and a smile crept onto her face. Wow, what a pretty path, she almost whispered, her voice almost entirely masked by the low volume of the radio. It's a good thing. I mean, we never have to worry about the neighbors throwing parties and keeping us up all night, I replied. She giggled at me and smiled. She took my hand in hers and then continued to look out the window. The path soon snaked around a small pond and we found ourselves in the middle of a glade. The clearing was bordered by woods with the house located in the center. The practically impenetrable forest made the house look tiny in comparison. The dirt path we had been driving on had led to the side of the house and around the back. Instead of seeing the path to its end, I parked 20 feet from the front entrance. The house looked like a projection of my car. Old, run down, but gets the job done nevertheless. The front door was directly in the center of the house, with windows spaced evenly on both sides. Old brown siding, topped with a dilapidated black shingled roof, gave the home a slightly ominous look. I unlocked the doors as we unlaced our fingers and got out of the truck. I walked around to Hannah's side, and we both stood there silently observing the place. This is where we were going to be spending the rest of our days. Well, it's not the prettiest thing I've seen, but it's got character, you know. 
We could always go into town, buy some new paint and touch up the outside, and once we save up enough money, we could have someone reaching the roof. I for one can't wait to start planting my garden, she added, breaking the thick silence. I took it all in for another moment, imagining what Hannah had said. The garden out back, the potential of children running around the yard, maybe even throwing a ball with our future family dog. A smile formed proudly on my face. It's perfect, I finally said. Hannah turned to me, mirroring my glee. We unpacked and moved our belongings into the house. The home was small, only three bedrooms and one bathroom all along the back wall. Through the entrance of the house, there was a giant main room. It consisted of a kitchen, a living room, and a dining room, all assigned to that open area. We turned the extra rooms into offices for work, one for me and one for Hannah. Although, we wouldn't be able to use these offices until the following Wednesday. That's when the Comcast people were supposed to venture out to our estate and set up the internet and landline. That meant Hannah and I were taking a much needed hiatus from our jobs. We decided to take a trip into town and try to get an understanding of the surroundings that we now lived in. So we headed back down the dirt path and deserted road and found ourselves in a small town that had a main street with small shops all along it. We continued to take the main street for some time and tried to identify restaurants that we would potentially eat at. Dell's Diner was one of the first establishments that we came across. After not eating for the entirety of the drive, Hannah and I were famished. We walked into this small, very cozy diner where we were greeted by a middle-aged woman. She had wrinkles around her hard, dark eyes, and she wore a red polo, khakis, and a pink and red striped apron to top it off. The name tag pinned on her upper left chest read Bianca. Just two? Uh, yes ma'am, I responded. Follow me, she said indifferently. Bianca grabbed two menus and slowly made her way down the path with the booths and tables lining the edges. Suddenly, she stopped and turned towards us. She stuck her arm out and pointed to the booth to her right. She placed the menus on the table. Hannah took the initiative and scooted into the side furthest away from the tired looking waitress. I slid into the seat next to Hannah. We settled into our seats and turned our focus back to Bianca. She reached her hand into the pocket of her apron and pulled out a pad of paper and a pen. Are you two just driving through? She asked. No, we're actually moving in. We bought the house on the outskirts of the town near Edwards River, Hannah responded. Bianca turned her attention to my wife, surprise obvious on her face. She looked puzzled as if she was trying to decide whether or not to inform us of something. Hannah and I shared questioning glances with each other, the entire diner filled with an awkward silence. It felt like this verbal agreement to remain in silence lasted a lifetime, when it was probably just 30 seconds. So, you are the folk that bought Jorge Peterson's house. What should have been a dry emotionless statement was filled with emotion. She said this as though she was pitying us. My wife picked up on it just as soon as I did, and a pit started to form in the bottom of my stomach. Is that not a good thing? Hannah challenged. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. You two aren't from my neck of the woods, the waitress said while she put the pad of paper and pen on the table. Well, Mr. Peterson was a very nice guy. He'd come to this diner after his hunting trips and would always get the same old thing. She said this almost reminiscing trying hard to picture the man, a scene she had become accustomed to. Well, one day his brother decided to surprise him and his sister-in-law, but when he arrived at the house, it was abandoned. The brother called the cops after he found blood in the house. He started searching for them and ended up in another glade. This one was littered with blood. The town folk had tried to organize a search party, but it never amounted to anything. The sheriffs had investigated the matters for a while. They tested the blood and it was Mrs. Peterson and their ten-year-old daughter. There was a lot of blood. Too much blood. She looked at the table, pausing her story, haunted by the image. You could almost see the sadness reverberate out of her eyes. Hannah and I were completely engrossed in this haunting story. All of these events were unknown to me when I was in the process of purchasing the house, although it did help to explain why the house was dirt cheap. The Peterson girls were never found, and the police are still hunting for Jorge. It's just crazy to think that in this small town where I've lived my whole life, something this terrifying could ever happen. It messed me up for a while. Our daughters used to play together. 
Explaining this to my daughter was one of the hardest things I've ever done. She trailed off her anecdote and continued to stare blankly into the distance. She exhaled loudly and lightly shook her head, trying to erase the image as if her imagination was an etching sketch. Breaking the thick atmosphere, she returned to her duties. So, what can I get for you two today? We ordered and ate a relatively subpar meal and left. The whole diner was shrouded in an uncomfortable silence and in company of long pitiful glances from the waitress. The 20 minute car ride home was also plagued with the same uncomfortable muteness. Arriving back at the house, the once ominous look had now been morphed into something straight out of a horror movie. The surrounding woods had been swallowed by darkness, with the clearing only lit by the dull moonlight. The outside air was undisturbed, not a creature to be heard, only the faint sound of leaves rustling around us. We headed into the ranch and found our half-assed bedroom set up. I changed into pajamas as Hannah took a shower. I heard the rusted shower handle squeak, followed by the quiet roar of crashing water into the tub. I flopped onto the bed and immediately felt myself slipping into a deep sleep when I heard the sound of twigs snapping. My eyes lurched open and darted towards the window. The scene was painted in dim, harsh colors. Not being able to identify the sound, I decamped from the bed and tiptoed to the window. Yet, there was nothing. Not a single source that could have made the sound that was to be found. I noticed the tightening of my chest, and the slight condensation that was starting to form on the back of my neck and forehead. That damn waitress got to me, I chuckled under my breath. I returned to bed and retired for the night. In the morning, we continued to make the house feel more like someone actually lived there. Trips were made back and forth from town to get furniture and to get groceries. Something about that eerie story that Bianca had told us really resonated with me. It kept stirring and fermenting in my mind. I craved more information of the travesties that had been committed on my property. I had taken the truck back into town on a relaxed Wednesday morning. In search for answers, I later found myself at the library. I went to the public computers that were placed in the back of the building, and I began my search. At first, there was very little that I could find, until I stumbled across a particular article. The article provided me with the information that I was seeking. It read, Jorge Peterson and his wife Deborah had been living in that ranch with their daughter Noelle. The ranch had been in the family long before Jorge had been born, and it was gifted to him after his grandmother had passed away. They had lived there for a short five years before the incident that incited my search. According to the article, not only was the family missing, but they had been missing for a long time. In the article, it had been stated that the two girls may have been dead for up to a month due to how aged the bloodstains were. A cold chill spread throughout my body when I read the next passage. There had been forensic evidence showing that the stains were of different consistencies and volume. This meant that there is a possibility that they were not killed at once. There could have been several times where he attempted murder or the girl sustained torture. Thoughts of this man making his way back to my house made me stand up and push my chair back in too fast, making it crash to the ground in a giant heap. I looked around the tiny library. Luckily, I was the only one in the direct area. I got a grip on my panic and made my way out of the building and began to quicken my speed home. I left Hannah home alone and who knows what could be out there or even worse, who could be out there. My truck groaned at me as I took it down the dirt road too fast. Rocks clinked on the mostly exposed, rusted underbelly of my Tacoma. Once the house came into my sight, I could see that the front door was open. My stomach tightened. I swung the truck door open and did a light jog to the doorway. I was out of sight from anyone that could be inside. I quietly shuffled my feet to the door so that I could peek into the somber house. Thoughts of the twig snapping last night flashed through my brain, making me regret ever rationalizing the sound. I peered inside my home and saw nothing. I could feel the panic rising like a lump in my throat. My eyes started to tear up. I blurted out Hannah's name on accident, but then continued to shout it. I stood still, trying to focus on any sign of her or anything that could lead me to her. I started to walk around the house, and as soon as I completely rounded the corner, there was a loud scream, and Hannah ran into my arms from about seven feet away. 
My legs buckled and I fell to the ground. My stomach completely dropped and tears formed in my eyes. She started laughing hysterically, not knowing how bad she had just frightened me. Normally, I wouldn't have even flinched in her attempts of terrorizing me, but she truly got me this time. What she didn't know is how true the danger could have been. Three days went by without a bother. We had arrived in the rural area on a Tuesday, and it was now Sunday night, our couple date night. Hannah and I made a trip down into town to go out for a meal and just enjoy each other's company. During this dinner date, Hannah began to indulge in a couple alcoholic beverages, and when the date was over, I drove us both home. We arrived to our house at about 1 a.m. Hannah collapsed into bed and was out like a light. She had been so tired that she still had her heels on, and being the good husband that I was, I had taken her shoes off and put a blanket over her. Feeling accomplished, I went to take a shower, but something just felt off. When I had walked through the front door, I could just tell that something was different. The air felt daunting. It was that uneasy feeling that makes you run up the stairs when you're home alone as if somebody was chasing behind you. I changed my mind about the shower and just undressed to my boxers and got into bed. I began drifting to sleep next to my inebriated wife, but I could hear the noises coming from around the ranch. I played them off and tried my best to explain them and give a name to each of the sounds. After being here for almost a week, there hadn't been much activity at night, besides the one or two twigs that would break. And that's when I heard it. There was this low screeching, like a fork being dragged across a plate. I immediately jumped out of bed and grabbed a baseball bat that I kept in the room. I sprinted out of our bedroom and ran into the front area. I had tried to stay quiet and listened intently to the sound so that I could dial in on the location it was coming from. I began to creep stealthily to the side of the house that the deranged noise was coming from. I tried my best to navigate through the space even though the house was almost completely pitch black. Outside it was more illuminated, being almost two days from the full moon. I inched to the window where the sound was coming from and positioned myself to the side of it. I peered out the window and saw nothing at first, until my eyes started to adjust to the darkness. I could see that there was not a living thing from the house to the woods, but as my eyes became more accustomed, I could see that the darkness was producing shapes at the edge of the clearing. I began to make out five human figures. No, seven figures. They appeared to be dressed uniformly, and it looked as if they were in robes. They stood there unmoving, in increments of what looked to be twenty feet. I stood there, not knowing how to handle the situation. And then I heard movement outside the window I was standing at, and I saw a figure rush off to join the rest of them. I sat there distracted, trying to see what this person was doing, but then I could hear rattling. It was the doorknob. I could hear somebody trying to turn the knob as quietly as they could, but I was from the city. I didn't go to bed unless the door was locked. After their attempt to gain entrance, I had just realized one of my worst fears had come true. Someone was out there, in the woods, and they were after us. I briefly thought about the money I had invested in the property, and all the equity that we might lose if we had to leave, along with the amount of pain that it would be to move into our parents until we could find our own place again. I was snapped back into my fear when I thought of Hannah completely passed out in our bed and not in any condition to defend herself. I rushed back into our bedroom, and there I saw her, sleeping peacefully. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. Every rustle of the wind caused me to shoot out of bed with my bat in my hands. One time during the night, I could even hear that screeching again, but I didn't leave my wife's side. Then there was more movement. I turned my head to look out the window. My heart leaped as I saw a man staring back at me. The man seemed to be in his 40s. He had minor wrinkles that had formed around his mouth and deep bags that were under his eyes. Although his eyes were cloaked in the shadow of his hood, I could feel his hate burning a hole in me. I sat there, unmoving, as he turned and sauntered back into the forest. The all-encompassing dread had overwhelmed me and I was unable to move even if I had tried. The human figures were still out there in the woods. Now I was truly frightened due to the fact that they knew which room we slept in. 
There was no one for us to call, and we had no internet and no landline until Comcast came on the Wednesday. Relief flooded over me once I saw the darkness of the woods recede and become replaced by daylight. The once beautiful sky, filled with elaborate colors, was peaceful, but now it was just a reminder that we were on our own. Even though the daylight had overcome the horrifying night, I remained unmoved to my bed. My hand still clutched the bat, and my eyes focused on the ceiling. What have I done? I thought to myself. Instead of staying in the city with our friends, I thought it would be a great idea to move somewhere more kid-friendly and look at where we were now. Self-loathing and anger flooded me, but was soon disbanded by the sound of Hannah stirring in her sleep. She looked so peaceful, ignorant to the events that had just taken place that night. She rolled onto her side so that she was facing me. My eyes landed onto her pretty face. Her blonde hair was disorganized and spread wildly onto the pillow beneath her head. The blanket only went up to her waist, exposing her dress from last night. I contemplated not confiding the terror of last night, but finally came to the conclusion that she needed to know. I don't even know how long I sat there staring at her relaxed, peaceful face. Her eyes started to twitch and eventually fluttered open. Her big brown eyes met mine and she gave me a slight smile. Good morning, she cooed. My face remained cold and unmoving and she read my expression. Oh, what's wrong? Her eyes left my face and fixed onto the bat in my hands. Confusion spread across her face. We have a lot to talk about, I paused. Get dressed, I'll meet you in the kitchen. I got up and headed out of the bedroom. I closed the door behind me and made my way to the front door. I disengaged the lock and swung the old oak door open. The wildlife looked unfazed, as if it was without memory. The horrors of last night had not affected the forest as it did me. The birds and insects did not break from their cries and chirps. I scanned the trees, eventually finding my truck. The tires had been slashed. Dread immediately overwhelmed me and my mouth ran dry as pure terror coursed through my veins. I stepped back into the safety of my home and turned to see my wife exiting the bedroom. I motioned her to sit at the dining room table and she complied. I then started to recite the events from last night, including the news about the tires. The severity of the situation dawned on both of us and we started to cry. We didn't just cry because we were afraid. We cried for the children we might never have and the family we might never see again. Despair floated into the atmosphere as our cries turned into whimpers. Hannah's brown eyes, now puffy and red, were anchored to the table. I watched her as she sniffled and wiped her tear-stricken cheeks. So, what are we going to do, she pleaded. I don't know, maybe we could take the truck to town or at least see how far we can get. We would be lucky to get even two miles, but I don't even think it would go that long. I could try to put a spare tire on one of the front wheels, but that should be our last case scenario. When the words left my mouth, I realized how defeated we really were. Without a clue of who these strangers really were, or a notion of what they planned to do, we were at the mercy of their sinister delights. We spent all day preparing for our unwelcomed nighttime visitors. I placed the spare tire on one of the front wheels and parked the truck a few feet from the door. The little furniture we did have, we pushed against the windows and doors to the offices and bedroom. We left the front door unbarricaded, due to it being our only quick escape option. We sat in our bedroom with the largest piece of furniture. It was a wardrobe given to Hannah by her grandmother, and now it masked our bedroom window. With every hour of daylight shining, my eyes grew heavier. Sleep pursued me, but I fought with all my will to keep it from engulfing me. I wasn't strong enough. I awoke to Hannah shaking me. Her big brown eyes oozed with fear. The cool darkness of evening blanketed our ranch. It was night. Panic leaped in my throat and I kicked myself for falling asleep. Then I heard that familiar scratching sound. The strangers were running what had to be knives along our windows. It made a sound that would drive your hairs to stand on end. My wife and I sat in the middle of the floor, holding dearly to each other. 
That dreadful scratching persisted for what seemed like hours, until it had suddenly come to an end. Hannah gave me a worried glance. What do you think they're going to do? She asked almost to herself. I remained quiet, listening intently to our uninvited guests. Just as sudden as the scratching stopped, chanting took its place. The chanting started low and rhythmic, but progressed to a horrifying screech. The satanic shriek grew louder and louder, building in intensity with every heartbeat. The gibberish they were once chanting was now gone, and was replaced with guttural screams. The howl from outside appeared to be coming from all directions. Every window in the house began to be pounded on. A metallic warm taste filled my mouth, and I realized I was biting down on my lips so hard that it started to bleed. The pounding progressed to the visitors punching the windows, yet the integrity held true. Not a window had been shattered at this point. At least, none that we knew of. The chaotic wells from outside gradually morphed back into a rhythmic chanting. The volume of the howl fizzled off into a low roar. The abuse on the window deliberately subsided as well. As the relentless damage of the ranch waned, the once lawless, turbulent air became peaceful once more. My wife sobbed softly into my arms. Right when I allowed myself to think that it might be over, I heard two heavy knocks ring off the hard oak door. Hannah winced at the sound and continued to sob in my shoulder. We remained in the middle of the floor, anxious to see what our sadistic guest might want. Two more heavy knocks rang off the front door, followed by a dreadful silence. Come out now, and we don't have to come back tomorrow. A rough, raspy voice greeted us from the other side of the oak door. Petrified, I was unable to respond to the intruder. Hannah buried her face deeper into my already tear-logged shirt. Fine, have it your way, the raspy voice concluded. I shifted my arm around Hannah and began rubbing her back, trying my best to comfort her. Tears ran down my cheeks as I began to remember the family that I might not ever see again. Deafening crashes cascaded through the empty house and all the windows shattered simultaneously. I released my hold on Hannah and clenched tightly to the bat in my palms. So this is it, I thought to myself. No one is ever going to know what happened to us. We are going to fall victim just as Mr. Peterson's family had. But then there was nothing. Not a sound from outside could be heard. It was as if they were the darkness, evaporating with the newly risen sun, and there wasn't a trace of life. I was completely exhausted, physically and mentally. I had fallen into a deep sleep the moment that the sun had reclaimed the sky. Once again, I awoke with Hannah shaking me, although this time it was daylight. What time is it? I asked. 4 p.m.? I rubbed my eyes and sat up cracking my back in the process. Thick, dark bags were taking shape under Hannah's eyes. Did you sleep? No, we can't be sleeping at the same time. We'll have to take turns. This was a sentence I never thought I'd have to hear in my lifetime. I grew up in a small town in Idaho. My family grew potatoes for a living, and we never had much to worry about. I was the anomaly in the family, the one who moved away and lived in a big city. I would have never believed that something like this would ever happen to me. The idea of somebody coming into our house and doing who knows what to us while we slept is a very real and very scary possibility. Alright, you get some sleep then. I'll check to see if we have any supplies that we might be able to use tonight. She instantly put her head down, and I could see her chest start to rise and fall in a methodical pattern. She was fast asleep. I got to my feet and felt the blood rush to my head, causing me to feel faint. Color faded, and I only saw black and white as my vision swirled. I stood there, trying to regain my balance while the color slowly returned and I didn't feel dizzy any longer. I staggered to the oak door and disengaged the lock. A lump formed in my throat as heat spread on my face. I gave the door a pull and it swung open, whining and creaking the entire time. 
A bright flash from the center of the oak door caught my eyes. One of our visitors had embedded a hunting knife in the dead center of the door. I yanked the knife out and quickly tossed it inside the house. I took a cautious step outside, sealing the door behind me. I could see the grass disturbed around the perimeter of the ranch, as if a herd of cattle had grazed on a field. Deep scratch marks had been etched into the siding of the house. Anxiety took complete hold of me and I dashed back inside. I triple checked that I had employed the lock on my arrival into the house. Pure dread manifested within me as I envisioned the night to come. I was grateful for the gift that they had embedded into my door, but terrified of the implication. I pondered the meaning of it. Did they want us to protect ourselves, or were they just leaving us a message? A hopeful thought popped into my mind. We only needed to make it until the Comcast employees arrived to set up the internet and landline. All we had to do was survive the night, and then we'd be free from this nightmare. We only have to survive the night, I thought to myself. I took my place next to my wife on the ground, and I lost myself in thought. I sat there wishing for the sun not to set, but I could see the pink and orange light fill the sky. I looked longingly at my sleeping wife. Her face was so soft and beautiful, like the first day we had got here. I exhaled loudly and my heart began to pick up its pace. I stirred my wife awake and we moved out of the bedroom and into the open area. We sat in the dead center of the room. I began to unscrew the doorknob and flipped it so that the lock was facing us. Once I finished the busy work, I locked the door and sat next to Hannah. Darkness began to slowly shroud our yard. Soon the trees exchanged their tranquil vibe for a dark, omniscient anguish. Still weary after emerging from her stupor, Hannah asked where the knife had come from. It was a gift from our neighbors, I said, and began to laugh at this dark, tortured joke. Hannah joined me, only laughing to keep from crying. We remained huddled in the middle of the room and faced ourselves to the front door. We just need to make it through the night. Then in the morning, the Comcast people should be here and we can leave with them, I said, trying to reassure myself. That's when the faint sound of chanting could be heard. Dread lurched deep from within me. I could feel the blood pump anxiously through my veins. The chanting grew louder and closer to the ranch with every passing second. Whooping and shouting broke the methodical rhythm as the chant began to morph into chaotic screaming. The obnoxious screaming came to a halt as it reached the perimeter of our house. A dreadful silence settled in the air, only breaking to the sound of two heavy knocks. What do you want? My voice cracked as I yelled at the intruders. My wife clutched my waist tight, her head buried deep in my shoulder once again. There was no response to my question, just an eerie stillness. You, the man said with a raspy voice. My wife hyperventilated as my eyes began to flood and my mouth ran dry. The doorknob rattled as the solicitor once more tried to gain entrance. Bangs and crashes resonated throughout the house. The vibrations could be felt from where we were sitting. There was no doubt in my mind that whomever was outside had found their way past one of our barricaded windows. My wife's once gorgeous eyes widened to an extreme amount, staring intently at the entrance of our bedroom. The door began to shake as someone from the other side attempted to break it off its hinges. I handed the hunting knife to my wife and she clutched it as if her life depended on it. And it very well might. I rose my baseball bat in preparation to strike, but then the door ceased to jerk. A metallic clinking sound could be heard from behind us. I swung around and I saw the lock disengage. They were distracting us. I rushed to the door, but my attempt was fruitless. It violently swung open and two men outfitted in dark red robes rushed inside our home. I didn't even think. I swung the bat with all my might and it connected with the first man's head. An appalling snap and cling resonated after the hit. A spray of red liquid splattered across my clothes and face. I watched as the man fell like a load of bricks onto the wooden floor. 
a dark, starchy liquid started to form a puddle around him. Harrowing excitement coursed through my icy blood. I swung my bat at the second intruder as he darted towards me, and another strike found its target. The spray of gore found my face and clothes once more. Before he could even hit the ground, I clutched tightly to my wife's hand and we scrambled towards my Toyota Tacoma. I swung my driver's side door open and threw her inside. I heard the sound of footsteps approaching us as I secured myself in the vehicle. I put my key in the ignition and turned. To my amazement, the truck gurgled to life instantly and I slammed my foot to the ground. The truck jerked forward and began to pick up speed. Contrary to my previous assessment, the flattened tires handled far better than I could have ever imagined. I held the pedal to the floor and set us on track towards town. Right as we neared the entry of the woods, three men dressed in crimson robes leaped from a bush, causing me to swerve to avoid them. This sudden swerve took us off the main path onto a forgotten path that had not been maintained. The flattened tire struggled with the raw environment, and we drove for almost a half mile when we came to a fork in the road. At that moment, more clansmen emerged from the bush, standing side by side on one path in the fork. One of them seemed to be pointing a firearm in our direction. I slumped in my seat in anticipation of bullets tearing through our windshield. I shifted our path to avoid the men and we sped past them, kicking up rocks the entire time. We drove, narrowly dodging trees. The whole time I sat there, I was filled with deep emotions. Emotions I had never felt before. It was true thrill. Pure, unadulterated thrill, like the first time I had ever been on a roller coaster. I used to relish this feeling, but dread still had its claws deep within me. We drove along the mismanaged path until there wasn't a path to follow. My headlights barely lit our line of sight, and we suddenly weren't in the woods. We were in a clearing. A clearing that was identical to the one where our house was built. I slammed on the brakes, and the truck came to a screeching halt. A loud, thunderous chant came from outside the vehicle. Many merged from the tree line, cloaked in dark red, marching towards us. There had to be like twenty of them, all closing in on us. The men in the road were leading us here, I thought to myself. This is the clearing where the Peterson women were found, I announced. I looked to Hannah, and she was shaking and sobbing uncontrollably. I stiffened in my seat and unlocked the door. I clenched the handle and pushed it open. Hannah screamed at me hysterically and begged me to get in the car, but I allowed myself to slip from the seat and my feet found the earth. I walked to greet the man sauntering towards us. All the men stopped moving except for one cloaked cultist that continued to get closer to me. I presumed this to be their leader, and he continued until he was in talking range. He was a stern looking man. His mouth was rigid and his skin was dark. Thin wrinkles were present surrounding his mouth. Without a doubt in my mind, I knew that this was the hooded man I saw outside my window. A smirk formed on his face and I felt him glare at me. How are you enjoying the new home? He asked in the same raspy voice that was outside our door. Well, it was fine until you guys showed up, I exhaled quickly in the form of a laugh. His smile slowly faded. Whether you allow us or not, We are going to sacrifice your wife. She is needed. He said the last line with great gusto, as if it would convince me. The feelings from before stirred in the pit of my stomach. Before I could respond, cloaked men rushed the truck and hauled Hannah away, kicking and screaming. While I was distracted watching her, men rushed me and forced me to my knees. They held tightly to my arms, preventing me from escaping. They then carried her to the presumed leader. The men dropped her to the ground and they began kicking her violently. She soon was left without any strength to fight back. I squirmed, trying to free myself, but to no avail. The presumed leader conjured a knife from his robes. Wait! I screamed at the man. He returned his attention to me, that hard, emotionless face staring in my direction. That stirring of thrill began to build once again. These emotions had a trigger and the trigger was violence. Before contemplating the repercussions, I responded in the hope to rediscover this overpowering emotion. 
Let me do it, I said as thrills swirled in my stomach with warmth allowing the excited rush to conduit through me. The leader smiled, a genuine smile, as if his children had come home to visit him. He nodded a slow and careful nod, making sure his identity was concealed the whole time. The cultist suppressing me released me and I was free to move about. I slowly pulled myself up to my feet. The leader flipped the knife in his hands, exposing the handle to me. I took the blade from his grasp and took a step back. Tears filled my eyes and poured down my cheeks as I prepared for my next action. I slowly lifted the knife into the air and plunged it deep into Hannah's chest. She screamed and howled as dark crimson blood oozed from the wound. All sadness and despair left my body as thrill manifested within me. I looked to the leader as his hands rose to his hood. He slowly pushed it off, revealing his face. Welcome to the Brotherhood, Jorge Peterson said with a smug grin on his wrinkled face. A man to my left handed me robes and a frenzied passion took hold of me. The feeling of acceptance that once eluded me was now all that I felt. More tears licked from my eyes, tears of happiness and joy. The only thing I could say to my new family was, when do we start? There is no fear as potent as the fear of the unknown. No monstrous visage discovered yet has been as terrifying as the infinite potential for horror which exists before the mask is removed. That is why we humans, in our naive misunderstanding of the universal order, are gripped by the mortal fear of death. We think it the final frontier, the greatest imaginable unknown from those penumbral shores no traveler may return. And so we cling desperately onto even the most dreary and anguished lives, suffering any known evil over our release into the beyond. But death is not to be feared. Because death is very well understood. We have witnessed it, caused it, measured and recorded it to the last dying spasm of neuronal flickering. Even as I lay dying, it seemed silly to me that I should be afraid of the emptiness which reason promised to expect. While I was alive, I wouldn't experience death, so there was no reason to be afraid now. When I was dead, I wouldn't be capable of experiencing anything, so fear still had no cause. That thought brought me great comfort as I felt the last erratic struggle from my heart against the inevitable conclusion I approached. It wasn't until I was finally drifting off to sleep that a final intrusive doubt bubbled in my brain. What if it isn't death? which is to be feared. What if it is what lies beyond? In so troubled did I slip beyond mortal understanding, stepping into a world as far forsaken by reason as I was now from life. I was still in the hospital room, but the bustle of nurses and the beeping machines lost their opacity as though I was mired in swiftly descending dusk. It seemed as though every sound was an echo of what it once was, every sight a reflection. With each passing moment, the world was becoming less real. But all that sight and sound, all that being, it wasn't simply disappearing. It was transforming into a figure beside me. The less real my room became, the more real the figure was until presently it existed in such sharp actuality that nothing beside it seemed real at all. His cloak was black, not the color black, but its essence. It was as though seeing a tiger after a lifetime of looking at a child's crude drawing and thinking that's all a tiger was. Reality flowed around his scythe like a brush through watercolors, and I could see each elementary particle in time, itself, sunder across its blade. Surely this, I thought, 
This is why we were taught without words to fear death. I clutched at my hospital blanket to cower from the intensity of the reaper's presence. But the once soft cotton now flowed like through translucent mist in my hands. I knew in that moment that nothing could hide me from the specter's grasp, for he was the only real thing in this world. You're late. They weren't words. My head ached from the strain of this knowledge, as my lateness was burned into my awareness, imparted like an inescapable law of physics as unequivocal as gravity. We don't have time for the usual speech. Hurry now. I felt myself swept up around him like dirt in a hurricane. Before I knew what was happening, we were outside the hospital, moving at such a frenzied pace that the world around me blurred into a dizzying tunnel of flashing light. If you're lucky, it will have gotten bored of waiting for you. I had too many questions, all fighting for attention in the forefront of my brain without any making their way out. You're quiet. I admire that. Usually, people ask too much. What's the point? I asked. My voice fell flat and dead compared to his overwhelming substance. How can I try to comprehend something so beyond my mortal knowledge? You can't, but it's still human nature to ask. We weren't slowing. If anything, our pace was increasing. I wasn't running or flying or anything of that nature. It was more like the rest of the world was moving around us while we stood still. A vague darkness and heavy damp smell made me guess that we'd gone underground, but I couldn't say for sure. One question then, I asked. What else is here beside you? And that is why questions are pointless. Death is not a place or a person. It's all there is. Troubling thought, but made me more so by the growing howl which began reverberating the rocks around me. We still seemed to be descending into the earth, and the air was growing warmer and denser now. The sound continued to mount, as though the world itself was suffering. Then what is it? What I'm here to protect you from. The rocks split from a flash of his scythe, and the ground opened further into a sprawling cavern dominated by subterranean lakes. But I thought you said you were all there is. No. I said death was all there is. We weren't moving any longer. Light glinted off the scythe from some unseen source and streamed into the lake like a tributary. Once inside, the light didn't reflect or dissipate, but swirled and danced like luminescent oil. I thought you were death. Death is not a person. The light was taking a life of its own inside the water. The still surface began to churn with enigmatic energy. It took my scattered mind a long while to realize that I was the energy flowing into the lake. I still felt tangled up with the figure, but we now existed as a beam of light boiling into the water. I knew I wouldn't understand, but that didn't stop me from feeling frustrated. If death is all there is, then what is it? What was waiting for me? The water pressed in around me, and I couldn't speak, although I could still draw breath somehow. It is here. Something was in the water around me. Hands grabbed me by the legs and began dragging me downward. I was amazed to even discover I had limbs again. They felt so alien to me that it was almost as though this body was not my own. Light flashed from the scythe. Then again, the hands let go, and the howling rose once more. The reaper was fighting something, 
although I couldn't make any sense of the battle except for the madness of thrashing water. The howling earth reached its crescendo, and the screams made the water around me convulse and contract like living fluid. Had the reaper cut it? Was I safe? I began to explore my new body in the water. But just when I thought I was beginning to gain control, the hands clutched me once more. I lurched downward, struggling in vain against their impeccable grip. What, what is there? I tried to shout against the suffocating liquid. What is happening? But I couldn't sense the reaper's presence any longer. The heat was unbearable, but the cold depths the hands were dragging me toward was even worse. I became aware of a blinding light at the bottom of the lake, and though I struggled, the hands dragged me inexorably onward. I'm sorry. I couldn't fight it off. It seemed to be coming from so far away. We will try again next time. The pressure, the heat, the noise, the hands dragging me into the blinding light. I closed my eyes and screamed. I was free from the water now, but I just kept screaming. I couldn't bear to look at it. Whatever had stolen me. Whatever was death, but wasn't. Whatever even the reaper could not defeat. Then words spoke. Real human words from a real human mouth. My senses were so distraught that I couldn't make any sense of it, but I'm guessing they were something like, Congratulations, he's a healthy baby boy. Most people can't remember the day they die, or the day they were born. I happen to remember both. And I know that they are the same. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Huge thank you to all the amazing narrators who helped bring these stories to life. You can find a link in the description to check out all of their channels. I've also just launched my merch store, so be sure to check it out if you'd like to pick up some cool Mortis Media themed apparel. And if you would like to do something truly incredible to help support the channel further, feel free to visit my Patreon page. You can find the link in the description as well as the links to my social media. And if you would like your story read on my channel, you can submit it as a text post to Reddit or send it to me via email. Both links can be found in the description. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.